First Timothy chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. We're probably not going to get past verse 1. But we'll read those first six verses. So, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created, to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Heavenly Father, Lord, again I pray to hear the prayers, Lord, that shared. Lord, I pray for the the folks, Lord, that uh, I keep seeing uh, out in the parking lot, Lord, uh, I pray, Lord, you'd move their hearts to come in, Lord, and I pray you'd give me an opportunity, Lord, to take some time and, and talk with them and hopefully share the gospel with them, Lord, uh, Lord, we need to be diligent about that task. But right now, Father, I need to be diligent about teaching this lesson, so I pray guide my mind, guide my words, Lord, so that what it is that you want to be shared and is shared, how you want it to be shared. And I pray and ask for this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I mentioned last week, as we ended chapter 3, uh, that this epistle had been written to Timothy from the city of Laodicea by Paul, and that that had significance to what was going to be found in the beginning of the next chapter, which is where we are. So we'll come to that as we go along. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Uh, now this is, of course, the Holy Spirit of God who is speaking, and he's giving to the Apostle Paul a supernatural revelation of what is going to occur 2,000 years into his future, which is right now for us. And that's why this is significant. Okay? We are living in the Laodicean period of the church. And that's why I say that is significant, that that's where this was sent from. There are no accidents, no coincidences in the Bible. Okay, these are the latter times for the church. That's exactly what's being spoken of here. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times. Okay, it's not talking about the tribulation. It's not talking about the millennial reign and the end of things. Okay? He's talking to Timothy, the pastor of a New Testament church in Ephesus that he, that he had founded there. Those are the latter times he's talking about. The latter times for the church. That's where we are. That's what is significant about what we're going to read. Okay? It's the church who's being addressed here says that he's speaking expressly. Okay, to speak expressly is to do so in an outspoken and distinct manner. The point being to ensure that the subject being related is clearly understood and that it is absolutely going to be clearly understood. Uh, you know, and that is... What Paul's trying to point out here, this is what the Holy Spirit has said very distinctly, very expressly, and we need to pay attention to that. That some shall depart 
from the faith. Now there's always been, always been some who have and will depart from the faith. I mean, just read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you're going to find that. Certainly been so with the church. Uh, we even read about that in the book of Acts. Uh, and Paul talks about it in his epistles. Nothing unusual there. I mean, it's sad and unfortunate, but it's not unusual. The fact that the Holy Spirit of God is making a point of giving this specific supernatural revelation to Paul indicates that what he's referring to is going to be something that is significant. Something that is unusual. Okay? Not just the typical defection of some few who have rejected scriptural truths. Now there have been, over the history of the New Testament church, some notable defections from the faith all through that church period. Excuse me. I don't know how many years back now it goes. It's got to be three or four years ago. I taught through the history of the New Testament church. So I'm probably at a point where I need to do that again. But we covered that when we went through that study. And, you know, as we go through the study, we look at the seven church periods and things that occurred in them. But here the Holy Spirit is referring to the latter times of the church, our time. Okay. And the fact that there are going to be some who are going to depart from the faith. Uh, I mean, one, I can mention, you know, that we talk about history of the Testament church this evening, which does tie in here with this one here, would be the establishment of what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church by the Emperor Constantine in 325 AD. Uh, by usurping the name Christian. Now up to this point, the church, uh, or not the church, sorry, the, the, the Roman Empire had been severely persecuting Christians, trying to stamp it out. Uh, because the one primary reason why, they didn't care about what it was they believed. It was the fact that they wouldn't conform to the official religion of Rome, okay, which worshipped the emperor as a living god. And they weren't being successful with that. It seemed as fast as they killed them, you know, more popped up in their place. So Constantine hit on the thing of, well, here, why don't we just usurp them? You know, we will become the Christians. We will become the church. Yeah. And so that's what, what they did. So they took the name of, oh, we're all Christians now. And they claimed the authority and the power of the church of Jesus Christ. And they began to teach their false doctrines and lies. Uh, ever increasingly departing from the faith once delivered to the saints, as it says over in Jude. Even during the Reformation, you know, now we're a long way out in the future, you know, uh, with those who were striving to leave the heresies of the Roman Catholic Church, you still had some false doctrines and heresies that they held on to and didn't want to give up on such being infant baptism. Okay. You had as many Protestants persecuting Bible-believing Christians, Anabaptists, our ancestors, if you will, because they wouldn't baptize babies, as had been the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, you know, that, that was one of the old ones they hung on to, and then they brought in a new one, Calvinism. You know? uh, today, in these latter days, there is such a tremendous amount of heresy.
heresy and false doctrine, false teachings uh, within the church that to say that some shall depart from the faith uh, appears to be a little bit of an understatement. But there's a significance here that, that we want to look at, that the Holy Spirit wants us to get. Because it goes on and says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's the key thing that we want to look at here. Uh, we live in a day when believers, those who have been born again, you know, that they're saved. Okay? But they reject what the Lord has clearly and plainly stated for sound doctrine, for their own opinions and preferences, how they want it to be. And they expect the Lord to conform himself to their demands and to respond to their dictations and directions. You know what they remind me of? They remind me of Israel on you know, Sunday school where we've been talking about, about Israel. Uh, the, you know, out there in the wilderness, 40 years, and how they keep blaming Moses. You know, and all Moses is doing is exactly what the Lord has said. Okay? They're not rebelling against Moses. Moses keeps telling them, you know, you're you're not rebelling against me. You're rebelling against God. Yeah. And this is how so much of the New Testament church is today. You know, oh, we don't want that. We don't believe that. We don't think it should be this way. We don't. It's like, you know, you can you can call me anything you want to call me, but it says that right there in the scriptures. So, <laughs> yeah. and they're con what they're doing. Whether they grasp it or not, is they are collaborating with the devil to attack and to destroy the Bible, God's words. And that has increased with, with I mean, just a fervor. You know, just to give you an example here, uh, some of the new Bibles out not too long ago, okay? Today's New International Version. Right? That's the title of it. Today's New International Version, 2005. The Modern English Version, 2014. The English Standard Version, according to who? You know, 2016. The World English Bible in 2020. The New American Standard Bible in 2020 and then the new revised standard version of 2021. And these are just a handful of, as far as I'm concerned, the satanic perversions uh, most recently introduced out there. I mean, on average, you're having a new Bible version introduced pretty much just about every two, two and a half years of some kind or another out there. There are probably right now, uh, in, if you include even limited production, uh, you know, publishing of them, probably well over 300 English language so-called Bibles. Talk about muddying the waters <laughs> and confusing people. Oh, they all say the same thing. No, they don't. I mean, you know, I mean, that's so ridiculous. They all said the same thing. They would all be the same, right? <laughs> you know, uh, now, the Holy Spirit of God plainly states that the driving force behind these people in the latter times of the church departing from the faith, okay, the driving force behind that is giving heed to seducing spirits. Spiritual warfare, I mean, real spiritual warfare is something that just simply doesn't even come to the forefront of the thinking of the vast majority of born-again believers. They don't, I can't see it, so it's not real. 
They don't believe that. And so to give heed, okay, to give heed to something is to give a specific and preferential attention to someone or something. And in this case, it is to seducing spirits, okay? To seduce is a negative action, okay? Uh, it entails the fleshly and carnal enticing of someone away from what is right. Now, whether they're aware, again, of this fact or not is dependent upon two factors. First, whether or not they've been properly discipled or not from the pulpit. And that's where, I mean, personally, as far as I'm concerned, the number one problem exists in the Church of Jesus Christ is right here in the pulpits. The pastors are the number one culprit. Okay. The second is whether they've chosen to follow the teaching and preaching of sound doctrine from the pulpit. You have a lot of guys out there who are being faithful to what God has said, teaching what God uh, has told them to preach, giving them uh, the sound doctrine of the New Testament, you know, and, but again, folks, you know, they can choose. You, know, you choose to do it, you can choose not to do it. I'll do it today, I won't do it tomorrow, I'm just going to do it a little bit. I'm going to take the parts I like, like a smorgasbord, uh, you know, and pick it. So those are the two two issues that go on with this, you know. And ultimately, okay, it still falls upon the individual believer to know and to obey the Lord's will and commands. That's you know, uh, that's where it's ultimately still going to come down to. Is each individual person is going to be held accountable for the choices and the decisions that they make. Now, these seducing spirits are, of course, the devils who serve the devil in his temporary reign over this present evil world. They are the principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, of, uh, of the spiritual wickedness in high places of Ephesians 6.12. You know, we just had our nation's you know, presidential election yesterday. Uh, well, the, the election went the way that ultimately, of course, God determined. But we have to remember, every nation on the face of this earth, and that includes the United States of America, there is a satanic power a spirit, a, a, a spirit being, okay, under Satan, who is behind all that goes on. And as much as a lot of Christians, because of their patriotism, don't want to accept and believe these truths, or try to put them aside, uh, you know. I, I, I've got a pastor right now who's not particularly happy with me because of a statement that I made about things, but I can't help but to tell folks the truth. You know, folks are all, you know, you know, all about this election, all about this is going to save America, this is going to turn things around, you know, and it's like, I have a feeling that, you know, and I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I hope I'm wrong, but I think the United States of America is going to uh, find out that, uh, you know, God is giving them exactly what they asked for, just like when, when Israel said, give us a king, and they got Saul. <laughs> uh, but that, I want to get off into that subject. Behind... Every mortal wickedness that we encounter in this temporal world, there is a spirit 
hand, a spiritual hand, and I'm talking about satanic spiritual hand, that is pushing and guiding it forward. We're supposed to be engaged in a warfare <laughs> against those spirit powers. That's where our warfare is. Again, going back to Ephesians 6. That's where you're telling us to put on the whole armor of God to be involved in that spiritual warfare. So when you combine the rebellion and the rejection, the self-centered willfulness of the average born-again believer in this Laodicean period, What happens, they end up, they have no means of discerning which spirit is speaking to them. You've got a, yeah, spirit, spirit yep. Yeah. I got the spirit speak, telling me this, telling me that, you know, okay. Well, whose spirit is it? There's a whole spiritual realm that exists all around us that we don't have the, 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 the sensory capacity to be aware of. You know, and that's if they're even caring to even listen to any kind of spiritual guidance whatsoever. Go over to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. 1 Corinthians Looking at chapter 12, verse 10. You know, talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and it says, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And look at 1 John. 1 John. And we're looking at chapter 4. And we want verses 1 through 3. 1 John 4, 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where you have heard that it should come, and even now is all ready, excuse me, is now, oh, I can't read it straight here, and even now already is it in the world. Now you've got a, a lot of folks out there that are, you know, I'm not talking about real believers here, where they're pushing this whole doctrine of, you know, uh, of course, number one, they deny Jesus Christ in the fullness of who and what Jesus Christ is. But then also when they're talking about him coming back, okay, and the things that they're talking about with him coming back, of course, what they're doing is preparing people for the coming of the Antichrist. Okay. They've built, you know, the world has their own Jesus. We've talked about this before. It was nothing at all like either Christ in his humanity or in his glorification. Uh, they will totally deny that. Every believer okay, ought to be praying to the Lord for the gift of discernment of spirits. That's a gift you want to have. Seeing we're all engaged in a spiritual warfare. But one of the things that you can do in order to gain that, one of the things you need to do in order to gain that Okay, is to be so thoroughly versed in the scriptures that the very instant that any lie or false hit 
priesthood is heard or read, that the indwelling Holy Spirit of God can flag it. Okay? Can flag it to you, to your spirit, with alarm. And you will immediately know it for what it is and reject it. Okay? But you've got to put this in there to give the Holy Spirit of God something to work with. You know, it's like knowing this book and then hearing somebody read out of one of the fake Bibles and it's like, huh? What was that? that didn't sound right. Say that again. Yeah. Uh, that, should, that's, that should happen. Yeah. And the more you are well-versed and have trying to find the right word to, to use the, the, you're, you're filled up with the sound doctrine of the scriptures as soon as the doctrine of devils pops up you know you immediately know there's something wrong here doctrines of devils are very common in the church in these latter times I hate to say some are very blatant uh, we're all the children of God. God loves everybody. Uh, there are multiple ways to God and to heaven. Uh, all Bibles say the same thing. Uh, we all worship the same God. Those are pretty blatant, bold uh, doctrines of devils right there. Others are more subtle. You know, they sound good to those who are scripturally ignorant. Now it's Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends are over the ways of death. Uh, things like easy believism with no repentance. Calvinism, where you've got, you know, some are predestined to go to heaven and some are predestined to go to hell, does away entirely with the free will of mankind and the fact that Christ died for everybody so that whosoever will put their trust and faith in him can be saved. Uh, Baptismal regeneration, okay. ecumenicalism, all, oh, you know, I believe in God, they believe in God, this one believes in God, so we're all good, you know, we can agree to disagree on other things, you know. You know, and, you know, God's word are only available in the original documents, in the original languages. And that's a very subtle lie that a great many believe. You know, and a whole host of others, uh, you know, false doctrines, the doctrinal heresies. Uh, you know, I mean, there's just there's just way too many. <laughs> uh, that, for me, that's one of the, that's one of the big signs that lets me know where we are in time. You know, but as I stated last week, you know, uh, you know sound doctrine is not a matter of agreeing to disagree. It is not a matter of, you know, personal preferences or, you know, you know while those things are irrelevant, uh, you know, sound scriptural doctrine is immutable and it is unconditional. There can be no compromise when it comes to these things. For to do so then is to open yourself up to the doctrine of devils. And believe me, they got plenty of them. It all depends upon who they're trying to deal with. I mean, they, they, they've got them for the lost, boatloads of those. They've got them for those who are scripturally ignorant, whether it's because, you know, they, they're just saved, they don't know the Bible, haven't had any uh, discipling at all. Or, I mean, there's, all depending upon who they're dealing with, they've got something to come after you with. And that's why you have to be constantly on guard. And one of the most important things that you can do is know the Bible. So I, I, I tell people that all the time. You have a personal, individual responsibility to know this book. Don't count on me. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the preacher said, well, men fail. Men make mistakes. Men fall. You, know? you need to know this. You need to be rooted and grounded, okay, and stand firmly on what this book says. And it's not a matter, okay, I'll, I'm going to spend